Good evening, everyone. We'll be short. We'll be starting shortly. Uh, in the meanwhile, we'd like to request all participants uh, that in order to retain a high quality of the webinar, please switch off your videos. You may switch them on again during the question and answer session. We should also be setting all attendees, except speakers, of course, on mute during the session. The setting will be restored to normal during the Q&A session. However, all participants are kindly requested to display your names. For those of you who have your videos on, we request you to kindly switch them off, but let your names be displayed. Thank you. Good evening and a warm welcome to all the participants and our distinguished panelists for today. In order to retain a high quality of the webinar, we would like to request all participants to kindly switch off their videos. You may switch it on again during the question answer session. We should also be setting all attendees, except speakers of course, on mute during the session. The setting shall be restored to normal during Q&A. However, all participants are kindly requested to display your names. Today we have with us two esteemed speakers who shall be addressing you for about 20 to 25 minutes each. The session shall be moderated by Dr. Roshni Yehuda, president of IAR, followed with question and answer session. During the ongoing session, participants are encouraged to type your questions in the chat. Thank you all for joining us today. Most of you are familiar with IER and have been regular attendees of our diverse and engaging high quality webinars in the past. For those of you who are joining us for the first time today, I would like to take a minute to introduce IER to you. IER, aka Institute of Environmental Architecture and Research, is a Mumbai based educational research and training institute with the vision create a sustainable environment through scientific research, education, and training, sociocultural understanding, community engagement, and awareness. We are a multidisciplinary group comprising of architects, planners, ecologists, engineers, botanists, microbiologists, lawyers, and academicians who have come together to form this wonderful organization after working collaboratively for almost 15 years. Our mission is environment first. Since its establishment in August 2019, IER has conducted numerous webinars for knowledge sharing and awareness with subjects ranging from human-animal conflict, indoor air quality, environmental impact assessment, river protection, traditional Indian architecture, and many more. 
In the past four years, we have continued to engage with topics that are relevant and thought provoking. Day two, we bring to you one such burning issue. The past few weeks have been witness to torrential rains across North India, urban floods in Delhi, landslides in Himachal Pradesh, heat waves across Europe, and wildfires in Greece. Almost everyone has been complaining about the extreme and unprecedented weather conditions. We are in the midst of a great paradigm shift and are witnessing firsthand climate change and its consequences. The number of climate refugees are on the rise. Glaciers are melting, yet rivers are drying up. Sea levels are rising. The oceans are getting warmer, resulting in frequent cyclones. Entire ecosystems are in a flux. As we brace our cities for the impending, yet unpredictable climate crisis, the question is, are we future ready? On this note, let us begin. I would now like to invite the president of IAR, Dr. Roshni Yehuda, to take this session forward. Dr. Roshni Yehuda is a practicing architect and academician whose core competency is in energy efficiency and environmental design. Dr. Roshni has a PhD in resource management and is a qualified expert and master trainer and paneled with the ECBC, that's the Energy Conservation Building Code, awarded by the Bureau of Energy Efficiency since February 2015. Dr. Yehuda is the co-chair for Asochem Gem Maharashtra chapter and the director of Roshni Udyavar and Associates. She's a member of All India Town and Country Planning Board, AICTE, and was part of a committee set up under the aegis of Niti Aayog on urban reforms capacity in India in March 2022. Roshni headed Rachna Sansad's Institute of Environmental Architecture for 14 years, from June 2003 to 2017, where she initiated several environmental projects in addition to a postgraduate course on environmental architecture. She has over two decades of academic and professional experience and has traveled widely on professional assignments to more than 20 countries. Dr. Roshni Yehuda, over to you. Thank you, Sunanda. Good evening and a warm welcome to all the participants of this webinar and especially our two speakers for today uh, from New York and from Oroville. Uh, to different parts of the world and we are, they are here to share with us. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Lalit, for joining us in today's program on climate change and urban resilience. As Sunanda said, this topic is very timely and it is quite tragic. We are seeing forest fires um, blazing and destroying cities in Canada and Greece on the one hand. And for the first time, you know, we heard this uh, terminology. The United Nations said that we are witnessing global boiling and no longer global warming, as temperatures in many parts of Europe reach stressful levels. Meanwhile, we have uh, intense precipitation, uh, you know, the same amount of rainfall that we used to get, but in a very short period of time, causing havoc in states like Himachal Pradesh, Gujarat, and also, of course, cities like Mumbai, Delhi, and also we saw Beijing recently. However, the distressing thought that went behind today's program was an announcement that I witnessed on BBC very recently by the president of Indonesia that this uh, fourth most populous country in the world is going to build a new capital called Nusantara, uh, which will be um, green and walkable city, etc. But the reason being that this capital, uh, that the capital of uh, Indonesia, that is Jakarta, is sinking. Uh, it is one of those cities that has become a victim of subsidence, of something called subsidence, that is excessive pumping of groundwater. And in this particular case, this is pumping of marshy aquifers, so much so that about 40% of the city is now officially below sea level. That was startling news for me. And surprisingly, there are other cities around the world like Mexico City, Tokyo, which are going through the same process and even parts of California. Another city which has witnessed somewhat uh, similar consequences is New York City, which according to a recent report, 
uh, holds a cumulative load of about 1.68 trillion pounds of the slightly more than 1 million buildings on it, causing this metropolis to sink and increasing its risk of flooding. So we have cities like Tokyo, Jakarta, Mexico City, New York, Mumbai, you know, some of the great cities of today, which are all prone to the effects of climate change, that is floods, storm surges, cyclones, sea level rise. Surely this current urban trend has, is putting a huge population at risk considering climate change and its impacts are already here. So we are asking what are the strat strategies we should have for these existing cities to sustain themselves? And what are the new urban planning paradigms that we should have for future cities? These are the questions to which we seek answers. And so this may be, uh, you know, this may not be the end. We, this may be a continuing dialogue. Uh, and I hope uh, there will be a lot of interaction and discussion today at the end of this session. And uh, today to enlighten us on this subject, uh, to lead the discussions, we have two leading experts, uh, architect Lalit Bhatti and Dr. Anne Radamaker. Uh, I will introduce, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to you both the speakers. So I'll first introduce architect Lalit uh, Bhatti, who will be starting the conversation. He'll be talking about, I believe, holistic planning. So Lalit is an architect urban planner based in Oroville for the last 25 years, is an executive and co-founder of Studio Path Architects and Planners, along with his wife, architect Shailaja. Oroville's first-hand living and working experience helped develop insights on the city as a living curriculum and how such a vision and movement could be a linking bridge to transformative and experiential learning and making our cities more engaging and empowering. Lalit has worked on Oroville Master Plan and has co-taught planning of sustainable settlements along with Professor Shankar of IIT Roorkee. One of his recent publications is aptly titled Enabling Transformative Urban Development for Integral Sustainability, a case for tapping the potential of Sri Aurobindo's philosophy in planning, practice, and theory. So I think this is a very apt point uh, to uh, hand over the, uh, the, the talk to Lalit. Uh, over to you, Lalit, and we are eager to listen to you. Lalit, are you there? Uh, Mr. Lalit, please unmute yourself. Yeah, he is. Uh, we'll wait for Lalit to come on because he wanted to be the first speaker. In case he doesn't come on, then I'll have to go on to the next speaker, which is fine, right? And um, yeah, Lalit is here, okay. Yeah, please unmute yourself, Lalit, and you can start with your presentation. It is just finished introducing you. You will need to unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I'm sorry, there was some time lag. I was facing some uh, issues with this. No problem. Uh, is it fine? You can hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. you can speak all a little right. bit louder and you can share your... Oh, all right. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Roshni and team. And uh, hello to Anne also. I'll be seeing her work for the first time. And uh, welcome to all the participants, the audience, those who have joined here. Uh, I'll directly go to uh, my screen share. Fine. Is it is it visible to all? Yes. Yes. All right. Yeah. Just let me know because earlier it was working fine, and now I'm seeing some kind of a slow response in my screen, uh, the net connectivity got 
All right. Uh, so uh, thanks again, Roshni, for the introduction and inviting me for this forum. Uh, I'll be sharing uh, Oracle's case study uh, primarily as something as a solution, something as where I have been living and working for last 25 years. And I see there is a huge uh, possibility material. There is a very good learning context, both practically as well as uh, spiritually, uh, which is the base of our world, uh, which uh, many other places, cities, societies, communities uh, can take. And towards that, one of the phrase which I have been using and uh, is the city is a living curriculum. That is the central line, which I would like to highlight. Uh, I will quickly go through some of the issues which already Roshni has mentioned. There are issues of either urban flooding, where there is an excess water, and there are places when there is a lack of water. Uh, these images we have seen in different parts of the world, in different medias, and somewhere this also, this image predicts or shows where we are heading where water will remain a key concern and our relationship with the water is uh, uh, how do we relate? How do we relate, respect? This will show us where we are heading or our collective uh, consciousness or intelligence. These are some of the images from also the recent flooding which have happened, which is like a yearly phenomenon in many places. Some of you may remember this is image from Chennai airport. Uh, I think few years back when even the runway and the whole airport of Chennai was flooded, you can see the planes are like floating. The simple reason, this is a whole runway area and where the trains, uh, planes are parked. Simple reason for this was, if you see also this image, this is a runway. If you can see also my cursor. So it is on, it is runway is built on, on a water course, Adia River. So if, if we do something like this once in a while, it is very much possible and it is becoming more and more enhanced practice that rivers are claiming their space. All the water bodies they need, they're also being in their own right. So how, so when they are exercising their uh, limits and possibilities and powers, this is the situation what we face. So designing and planning and building something across air, um, water course, which was a DR river in this case of Chennai. Of course, it was not at all a very smart, very logical, a good plan example. And uh, city of Chennai and the people, those who are using this airport and otherwise, naturally they will be facing an issue. Earlier, if I give a very quick reference, uh, Indian cities have been having for many thousand years, a special relationship. Uh, we have many temple towns, especially in South India, where they have been relating with water, not only as a very sacred space, but the, that sanctity was highlighted. And the, in the surrounding region where the, the development of water as a resource and the engagement of community has been a very healthy practice. So how do we come up uh, and relate with those things in the modern context is the challenge and I think also the need of the time. Uh, it is all connected when we talk about uh, uh, the climate change, both solutions and the issues. So how, how we uh, collaborate to manifest the city region's potential and how the city society, city I'm referring has hardware. And this is like my personal way of putting it together. City is a hardware and society is a software. So how city and society, they come together. So without hardware and software coming together, things will not work that those practical examples we know from electronics in our life. So how do we work towards it? Uh, let me see. Yeah. So what is the future of cities? The, the, the one of the key element of which will remain is future, uh, the ability of their engagement with all the participants and with all entities which are using the city and the region and but ability to transform uh, with everybody. So that will be the kind of future element which I here I'm highlighting some of the journey of uh, particularly Indian example. India is on a major huge urban trajectory. I don't have to highlight it huge. 
the kind of investment, kind of focus from different aspects is being uh, highlighted on India and huge, absolutely incredible amount of homework required for India. And civilizationally, if you see, particularly in India, we, we don't have a very good track record of developing, preparing planned development and implementing it and taking everybody on board. So it's a great challenge what we have. It's a real necessity India needs to work. And the required manpower for this is also lacking. So here I have been trying to make an effort to highlight, and this is the part of the solution I want to share and present. A city needs to be engaging with its citizens, institutions, or any other body, any arm of the city, whether they are business uh, people, or whether the topic of mobility, everywhere apart from the common sense, nice uh, technical solutions, we need to learn how to engage with the city. This is one of the key message I am sharing up front and to prepare well. So I give a short example of the, kind, uh, the number of students in India entering into architecture, how I think they need to be given a chance and opportunity, not only in architecture, actually all the campuses, what I want to emphasize, they need to be given a chance and opportunity how to relate well with the surrounding development and the development related issues so that the issues of development, sustainability kind of comes into their blood. They don't need to do a separate executive courses on those kind of things. So, they, and it is possible. I'm just highlighting uh, some of the examples here, if you see. So the collaboration, capacity development, creativity and co-creation. If the different entities, they work together, cities can be quite enriched. Uh, SDGs are also very good uh, framework which the different component and entities of the cities which we can work right from institutes, organizations, government. Uh, I want to particularly highlight here one element and I'm maybe some of you may be wondering where it is going but I'm going to the some kind of depth of the issues. Uh, what is the purpose of education if we relate with that? This is UNESCO's definition. They talk about learning to know, learning to be, learning to live together, learning to do, and learning to transform oneself and society. So if these are some of the core pillars, some of the elements, if uh, the people, those who are into learning and doing, and if they are oriented, naturally the city and society will automatically become part of the learning and growth charter of everybody. And that will prepare people to live together and work together. So this, this is also one of the elements which needs to be worked upon. Uh, there is a new education policy. Uh, the people, those who are, if there are some people, those who are not from India, uh, there are many elements, there are many possibilities. I will not go into the depth of this, but which can be leveraged upon, this is my point. They are talking about interdisciplinary study, potential, local context. So there is a good climate which is being prepared and I was not knowing that Roshni was part of this study, which I think is one of the very important study which has come out, which is talking about India's urban reform. So what we are talking about is ability to create our new urban narratives. Uh, there are art nirbhar element, the capacity building, learning. This was one example from Pondicherry. And here is, I'm uh, referring to some of the Simple example when we are studying, I'm giving examples from either you call architecture or other. If we bring together water, food, and open spaces, we know how traditionally conventionally courses are being taught. But if we can design, let us say, a studio around uh, food, so there's a possibility youth will come to know about farmers, soil, market, mobility, water, and there could be holistic design studios. And this can be integrated right from a school level to any. I mean, even MBA people can do the feasibility study, the profitability, organic farming, many things, all, all components. But by doing that, by introducing these kind of things, we are creating possibility for people to sensitize and make aware of their local living context and some of the key required facilities and support like food which is related also with water, mobility, many things. NIA is one of the organization which is doing a huge amount of work, very innovative work. Uh, if people are not aware, they can check out their website. I'm quite impressed with their 
uh, very uh, innovative and in reaching out of approach. Some of you may be aware uh, there was a plan for 100 years. There was a competition, rather international gas union, and Indian team has got second prize. Uh, they had to come up with a plan and idea, very detailed recommendation, how the future of living organization will be and which kind of issues will come, energy, food, security, land, soil, and what are the ways to work towards it. So I recommend people, those who are interested in this field to study or check out some of these documents because they give you a perspective into the future emerging situations. Again, I'm coming back to how we create conditions and possibility for people to engage in their city context. There was an exhibition, I think it was in London, uh, where on the issues of mobility, what could be the possible solutions, issues related to food, which are linked with the soil, water, which can get damaged during the climate change issues. So there are many choices to be made. So if we take a framework of self, society, and environment, and how different organizations, resources, economy, how they are connected, what we are talking is how the transformation can be mapped. And towards this, I am now entering into Oroville case study. Some of you may be familiar with Oroville. Oroville is a small uh, town emerging place based on the vision of Mother and Shirvindu. And Shirvindu says, all problems of existence are essentially the problems of harmony. So if we know the, the meaning and depth behind this, we'll come to know why we are in different layers of problem and what they are hinting us to go towards. And the true knowledge is not attained by thinking. It is what you are. It is what you become. So I like some of these quotations. He has many quotations, but uh, some of them, how we need to apply ourselves in the given context. Orville is based on the spiritual vision of Mother and Shri Bindu, And it is hardly 50 years, 52 years young. And Orville has a charter. Orville does not belong to anybody. It belongs to humanity as a whole a place for unending education, constant progress, and a bridge between past and the future, and a place for material and spiritual research. So this is important to keep in mind. I don't know how many cities can say or they have a charter, something around which the whole, whole citizen groups or the whole system comes together. So it is important. I'm also giving a hint as a some kind of solution. There needs to be something of whatever you call vision, mission, goals, objective, whatever terminology suits to any group, community. It is important to have some kind of common reference. So, Oroville is like 50 plus a year young. This was an operation time of Oroville. I'm going slightly fast because the timing is 25 minutes. Uh, this is this is important slide from the perspective. We have seen the environmental disaster and particularly being highlighted by climate change issues. As compared to that where the world is heading, Oroville started on the extreme on the other side. It was supposed to be inaugurated in these conditions, red hard soil, no budget, no equipment, no people, no business, nothing. A spiritual vision and a hope for the better future and the dedicated people, volunteers came this was a given site condition for starting a city for human unity, like great grand ideas, but very tough living starting conditions. Environment was already degraded. You can see it was eroded landscape. So the first, these were the first to work, the task. And they had a vision and a hope and a very strong willpower. They worked with the local population. They started moving uh, the initial development. The first work was naturally healing of the land. So this was uh, one of the biggest afforestation project of its kind in the given context. So the making the land livable was one of the work. So even if you were MA mathematics from Oxford, anybody from different background, everybody was working for environmental work because those were the conditions which will make you your living possible there. What happens when forest comes up? how it changes not only the microclimate and social conditions, it's like people can do many PhDs on that. So this is a very real living context and mass scale. So the first uh, revival happened, so it changed many things. 
So this, so even if it was supposed to be a city for 50,000, many things, the first conditions was preparing of the days, preparing of the land. So while working on that, Auroville learned by hand, and that was the beauty of Auroville, learning by doing. So the aim of Auroville is human unity, which is a very important yet very complex uh, topic. Uh, Orville is proposed for 50,000 population. We are approximately 3,500 people from 60 plus countries uh, where this central circle, one, two, three, four is written. We are the four zones connected by a circular spine called crown and further larger circle, which is uh, green belt and which has six native villages. This is a 3D uh, graphics for the proposed city form, urban form, which is known as Galaxy Plan. So, Auroville worked extensively on the uh, land afforestation, water, and the uh, mapping of all this information which is required. So, Auroville has been engaged in huge amount of green work in the beginning. So, whenever I'm explaining or giving an example of Auroville as a reference, there are already inbuilt messages when the world is not talking about green blue infrastructure, green blue planning. Naturally, of course, these things have to be taken care. These are some of the basic, absolutely truthful layers of planning if we need to save our cities from flooding kind of situation and which leads to many other issues, whether economic loss, health issues, productivity loss, many others. So that is to be required. So an honest mapping and understanding the water behavior I think these are the key tasks which need to be taken up. Uh, Auroville, in spite of being a small player, uh, has been aware of the role of the larger region and the region here is defined as the watershed area and we fondly call this also bioregion of Auroville. So what I'm highlighting is a group of committed people, even if their number was small, they were driven by certain high ideals in the charter, which was based on spiritual way. You have to kind of keep the whole narrative in mind. And within their limited uh, knowledge, understanding, but with the huge will to do work, will to be engaged in the surrounding work, they have been engaged even in the larger region. And uh, they worked on the water uh, tank rehabilitation, organic farming, sports engagement, many, many, many activities, which I'll highlight some of them later. Sorry. And there are many farms and many students, researchers, professionals, those who come and all of the farm of Auroville are organic farms. So many people are engaged in them. So how does city and region feed? This is a quick shot of man-made forest. This, there are many even more beautiful areas. Auroville has been working with the water, water catchment or the wastewater treatment plant. Literally, there is no development in Auroville where there is no treatment plant, so treated wastewater is used for farming, addition, and related purposes. Auroville has been replaced. Auroville has given people, I would say, the sense of freedom. With that, then people have been doing experiments. And these are some of the experiments of renewable energy. So today, also because of the windmills, which are there further south in South India, uh, there are three windmills which belong to, somebody has donated to Auroville. They generate enough electricity or power to meet all of Auroville's uh, requirement. And rather, Auroville is feeding, Auroville is part of connected grid, biometering is there. So, Auroville is giving back the energy. Education is one of the key elements. What I'm trying to highlight is about the integratedness of development and integratedness of the society. So, to be able to engage and to go to that level, towards that. And this is what Auroville has been trying. So it is very much possible for all others. So the connections, we need those adapters, the connections, the sockets, the USB ports, universal type societies to be built. I'm just quickly, so the expressions, whether in architecture, so I'm giving you a kind of a quick uh, shot of uh, the different activities which have been happening, the experimentation, the search for beauty. This is a school which does not, uh, believe in degree and certificate so their their emphasis is joy of learning and what they have created the environment and the kind of learning experience is i think worth experiencing first but if i always recommend people to come to Auroville, there are many groups and people keep coming to see it first in 
So this has also given uh, the alternative construction technology. Oracle is a kind of almost a very great knowledge center for of learning. People have been coming for alternative learning practices. There are many papers and there are many more detailed information on Oracle website, videos about those things. So all of these practices have naturally been evolving in Oroville, which is giving a sort of uh, uh, edge or advance, uh, I would say advanced prepare, preparation or mindset, the culture which is getting developed to deal with environment, ecology, and, and further development which is getting created. There are many recognitions which Oroville has got in diverse field. Uh, you can check out if people are interested in uh, on Oroville website. Art plays a major role to bring people together also. And this is the way sometimes people come together, collective meditation or events. So the sense of community, community engagement. This is some more images about art. I'm just going a bit fast just to honor the time as much as possible. And also community participation. Oroville has been very, very active uh, for the last 50 years and different engagements. So you have to also understand and take it. Oroville is a grand experiment of that kind. So it's not saying everything is uh, only fully worked out, everything is easy. No, nothing is easy, nothing is nothing gets easily worked out. But the effort and willingness people put into to make it work, I think that is always very inspiring for me. And it goes through its fair share of churning challenges, issues. But people keep applying because they feel this is a very good, valid, and very inspiring chance for us to learn how to be together and create what they also call Gnostic Society. One of the projects I have been engaged when I was planning coordinator is what we call ISP, Integral Sustainability Platform. How different aspects of a city and society, waste, architecture, housing, health, you can see there are more than 20. How they relate with each other. It was all about one and a half year study, very good recommendation. If people are interested, uh, my email ID I can share in the chat. I will be happy to share these links of these reports um, for everybody those who are interested to know and learn. Another thing which we did for engagement was planning a division uh, to relate with the residents. If residents are, they need to be made also aware, you know, when we talk about engagement, participation. So how in the beginning was our will plan, how the galaxy plan came into being, it was a six model, many other component. So these engagement activities are also part, people engaged in. Uh, food self-reliance projects, so healing of the earth, uh, organic practices. So when you are doing organic practices, naturally you also try to contact and reach out to the surrounding farmers, uh, share knowledge, transfer, exchange, how that can be done. Or will provide employment to more than six to 8,000 people from surrounding area in different sectors of activities. And Oroville is a reasonably well-known brand name, primarily for its design and also uh, pollution-free products. Uh, these are some of the products from the waste newspaper. Like that, there are many other activities. This is well paper. Local village women are engaged. And the waste is taken care in this way. Fairly well-known case of architecture. That was the house of the late chief architect. This is Savitri Bhavan Institutional Building. Uh, this is a visitor center. This is again one thing I'd like to highlight. In India, I don't think we have many cities which have visitor centers. So we need to improve quite a lot how to receive people, how to, you know, give a proper experience and possibility of informing them. You see, if you see our Instagram and many other things, the storytelling content is becoming a major element. So how do you how do you narrate? How do you make people aware? of a certain city, society, local context. So I think all Indian cities will have to have a visitor center of a kind. Yeah, I think it is coming. There are different examples. You can see it is in the bottom. It is written the construction technology which has been used. So Orville has acted as a very you know, experimental ground, which has been great. Uh, I think this is the housing from the waste construction material. And right from the beginning, this is important, and I would like to highlight and give a message. If right from the beginning, if we can do the walking and pedestrian track, that is, I think, a cultural element. So, you know, then this becomes a priority, and other things become either secondary or to be managed, and not so we don't compromise on these things. So many of our school children, my own son, 
we don't have to do anything. He just goes on the cycle whole day. Then it is all nice, safe, well, beautiful locations, shaded. We have our own intranet uh, where people give share their comments. So this is about connectivity and transparency. The news and note what comes out, uh, where uh, all the you can you can check it out on our website and download the detailed statement about the meetings which are happening, account statement, how much income expenses, everything is recorded here. So this is a very fair, honest, and brave practice, which also pushes both way. Those who want to learn and improve and do it further, all city, society, organizations, they can do. And for us also, how to improve our own reporting so that it makes more sense and takes it to the next growth. This is, I was engaged in one of the, we, we, we ran a series within Auroville for community. It was a kind of a tech talk style. Uh, the joy of learning we gave. If if if, the, if our community members want to take part in decision making, community participation, they need to be also made aware about the depth of the topic and the issues. So if for like educational purpose, so there was a series of 10, 12 talks. So Auroville economy, mobility, master plan, outreach, relationship with the surrounding region, water, food, many, many such things they were brought out, speakers were prepared. And you can see the mics in the center, the recording device. And on the top right, you see play is related. So you can still listen to all those talks which were given on, on the internet-based radio. So all this was shared, so like the communication, information, and many, many, many such. Like Auroville is a, what I call city. This is, I got my phrase from here. City is a living curriculum. It is helping us learn many things. And Auroville is a part of a system, the larger, uh, also the water grid we can see, South India, particularly this part of Tamil Nadu is very well known for its the tank irrigation and tank systems. So based on that, Auroville has already, again, you, what, what I want you to notice is very small group of people, a small town, not even a town by Indian urban standards. But uh, being aware of the issues which will come, there is already Puducherry, Vulipuram, Auroville, and Kadalu regional planning framework. I can share the link or you can Google and check out. So how in the future this area will undergo change, urbanization is inevitable. But what are the ways how to protect certain basic features, elements, and characters? So there is already a uh, report on that. It is available. I have been myself engaged in many learning activities. These were the students from Queen's University Canada. They have been, they have done five international planning studio with me here. How the changes of villages which are coming because of also the high touristic nature which Auroville is facing. And uh, so to prepare the background study material, international case studies. So Auroville is acting as a learning ground. These are some of the activities in the surrounding bioregion Auroville has uh, come up with. You can see on the bottom right, that is the nature of activity. So these posters which I'm showing, I have a full uh, separate PDF of this. If people want to know, I, I can share uh, the bioregional development activities. You can see in different topics, environment, ecology, livelihood and also if like our population is 3500 the but directly indirectly what Lauraville is touching a life of 50,000 to like people in the surround immediate surrounding area so it is creating a goodwill of grid of goodwill and even general the development practices a hope for the students children to learn engagement of the youth so this is the point which I learned I saw firsthand and I'm still very inspired by this how an idea which starts from, which has a root in spiritual and conscious society. We are far from it, but efforts are being made. Uh, how this development inside and outside is being coming out. There are many books, publications. One can check out of different education, architecture, economy, form, with plenty of things. There are different groups uh, which are working, sharing knowledge. So the future of learning relates to the vision of integral living. This is what I say, like you don't have to fix it, just for the sake of fixing them. Uh, there has to be a common vision, where are we heading? So I think that vision helps glide and slide people towards it and work towards it. And uh, these are different learning programs which keep happening in our world. 
if people are there from Chennai, they would know there is a Adiyar Pongla project, which has been revived and redone with the help of some of the audible consultants. And this is how it looks now. I mean, Indian cities are, I must say, far, far behind and lacking in terms of providing usable open spaces. So this is one area which is connected to, you know, water mobility, different kind of layers, which can be well. Um, am I done with my time? Uh, yes, I think we are I'm, just about. I'm, yeah. I think I am. Yeah, I hardly last few slides. Shall I just complete? Yes, yes, please. So, like this is, you can hear me because uh, I'm hearing you with certain time lag. You can hear me well. Yes, okay? we can hear you, but uh, oh, you can right. maybe raise your voice a little bit. Okay. Uh, so there are different studios. They were students from SEPT and other places, the urban design, a different kind of, they have been happening. So uh, to engage and to share and give back to the society. And uh, whenever they come, the students to learn from Auroville, naturally they learn about the integratedness within this environment, ecology, community dimensions are there. These are students from our University of Gujarat, those who came and uh, they were, given a task of designing the curriculum in a new way, and they are visiting our waste management facility. So from this perspective, once you know the issues of waste, now you go back, whether you are from MBA or IT or law background, they are mixed range of professors. So how do you begin an exercise with them? How to redesign their curriculum, keeping these sensitivities in mind? Uh, Auro Wilke's example has been there in, a, in national, international journals. These are some student group which have been coming to learn. So uh, what I'm showing and highlighting is there's a huge amount of and, and deeper, effective and enhanced learning and uh, learning experience by which people can be connected with the students, those who have been coming. About the waste management, construction technologies which have been happening here. So it's a very integrated approach. These are school. And uh, this is, yeah, the joy of learning uh, integral education as a model. This is our uh, center, the, also the zone of silence, peace area. Uh, I don't know how many cities have silence as some zone in them. So the message if I want to give is the key learning from our cities, self, society, and environment, but engage to transform. And how it has happened in Auroville's case is inner climate changes, inner climate change is a critical need too. So if we consider only climate change as an external subject, it will, it will almost not uh, be able to do what we are imagining to do. So the climate is not to be changed outside or climate is not forcing us. It is creating a context and condition for us to change our inner climate. Till we are not learning how to uh, be ourselves, realize our own human potential, not to be troubled by the normal rat race, what people call, and learn how to work together. You can only work together when you know yourself. So there are there's a series of things that, like if we talk about architecture planning, no, we do the layered mapping. So we are actually one of the most layered species. We are very layered. So if we know, if we map ourselves, so the beginning, the, the crux of the matter in this case, which I have to say, I'm not trying to demean and saying other efforts should not happen, must happen. But the core of that is we need to change our inner climate, the habits, the patterns. We So if we create, for example, possibility of a neighborhood and a network, which is walkable, there is a possibility and which is connected well with the mobility solution. There is a possibility people do, do not need cars or they don't need much cars. And if you don't have much car, the space on the street on parks is free where children can play and enjoy their health and well-being. So all this is connected. So we need to have a different perspective also and not to make climate change as a just to fix the solution as if we make a drainage around the city. So whenever there is a flooding happening, water can be circulated and thrown out outside and city is safe. It may be safe for one year. It may be safe for one monsoon. The nature of issues of cities for me are the startup 
for us to experiment how to live together. Why do cities came in existence? Cities is the biggest and most complex phenomenon of learning how to live together. So if, if we can relate with the, those deeper dimension of cities and city experience, we can work across, you know, a city is a very rich phenomenon. It has market, behavior, exchange, organizations, and if we can come together, so bringing all the elements together, it is that skill, that capacity is what we need. And it is very much possible to go around. So just give you some example from Oroville development, how in, in its own way, much before even UNDP, UNEP came into existence, Oroville has been practicing many of these things on its own. Some of the events I have been engaged, like cities a living curriculum, Sustainable Urban Future, along with the professor of IIT Madras, Dr. Christo, like spirituality and inner development based approach we need to touch. Otherwise, then there was an engaging cities, two weeks, very interesting seminar. All the recordings are also on YouTube and Facebook. You can check out city and region. Some of these things which have been also my interest and passion, because I see cities as the, you know, the platform to live on platform to live many different events have been happening some images just to end with happy note i go because of this event today roshni i have not gone for my evening walk to this place i go there daily <laughs> no it's fine but yeah this is it we are ending so yeah action in all around so it's an in living lab in integral city region, and this is it. Thank you very much. I hope I did not go too much over both. Thank you. Thank you, Lalit. I think uh, just by sharing with us the example of Auroville, you have uh, actually demonstrated what Auroville has already done and achieved. And indeed, I've been to Auroville over so many years, and uh, know that it's the, the fact that it's an experimental city and there and I do hear from the from the people of Oroville that there are many failures but at the same time uh, they have been learning from these failures and trying and doing things that are better than before in terms of all the you know the wastewater and uh, the uh, you know uh, environmental afforestation efforts and so on there are a few questions here which i think uh, if you can very quickly address because there are already time uh, for the next speaker so there are sure. you know two three questions so uh, i'm uh, reading them yeah, yeah. yeah you want to shall i go through or you want to read and i yeah i think you can address a few of them like i think two of them are uh, uh, talking about uh, one is about solid waste. Uh, so, how does uh, Oroville deal with solid waste, and is there uh, are there any lessons for us? Absolutely, one, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, I can. I missed actually. Good that you highlighted. Uh, I mean, I I mentioned that in a quick passing. Uh, okay. So, if I start with the second question, the solid waste. Uh, Again, this goes back to the culture and practice. So much before anything else, all our houses, places, we have three, four baskets in our house. So all the paper, plastic, organic waste, everything is sorted out. And at the level of community, like which is a cluster of houses, we have barrels. And uh, all this is also sorted out there. And we have an eco service, which is equivalent of our local municipal waste management facility, which comes. And there is a labeling. There is a like more than 50 60 type of labeling of the waste this is the one part of the waste management apart from that there are organizations people one of them is waste less those who have been doing incredibly amazing work you can check they have even gone to the extent realizing this issue that they have come up with a program and a course garbology 101 and their program they realize that adults are less hopeful it is difficult to change adults they are tough ones. So the target, the youth. So they have gone to the youth and they have tried to sensitize them with the playful game and activities. And their program and course is now already taken in class 10th of Tamil Nadu board. So this is what I'm trying to highlight is one is the actual physical activity, but we need to make these things at the level of cultural, like it should be in your breathing, it should be in your blood. 
and to prepare for that cultural transformation, to work towards that, to develop that kind of sensitization. So to engaging with the youth, lifestyle changes, healthy habits, you know, multiple things have to come together. These are all layers. So Orville has been working and uh, so most of the communities, they are composed, they are uh, organic waste and the uh, plastic waste, paper waste is segregated, goes for recycling. I must say our waste uh, collection and waste habits are also negatively increasing because of the different people, new people coming, it takes time to develop those kind of practices and to maintain them. Like that's a really genuine uphill challenging task. But or will the people are very engaged? Um, does it, uh, what sort of practice can be used in India to tackle uh, multiple, as I mentioned, always uh, start with making people sensitively aware that it is their responsibility. They are one of the chains. So it is not to see problem outside us. Okay, as if I am the nice one, I am doing everything fine. I am the bright shining example of climate change and all the problems is because of rest. It is not like that. So you start with once, if you are the good ones, your living energy, your embodiment living energy will directly influence others that you are able to do. And at the level of and anything else is an act of organization whether you call municipal organization, it's an act of organization. Use all your common sense, advanced knowledge, technology also to deal with that. Where you should put either your waste, there should be a scientific study and all those tools and possibilities are there. You need capacity to bring people together to do the appropriate mapping and do that as well. But program should be all across societies, people, workers, students. So again, if you see uh, my, my, my answers are more we have to learn how to relate and engage with all. That capacity has to be developed. Uh, I don't know whether it has- There are a couple of questions. Uh, uh, I think Akshay had asked about afforestation and what uh, key steps were taken for afforesting Oroville, which is one of the dramatic things that we saw from a wasteland to a forest. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe somebody has answered that question, but if you want to elaborate on that, and then there is one question about will or will join hands with educational institutions to sensitize due sensitize effects due to climate change. This is Anusha who's asking this question. Okay, so, hi Anusha. <laughs> so of course, Orville is actually doing it. Orville is doing it to the best of its, I would say, given understanding and capacity. I am myself one of the people. I engage with a vast number of students, professionals, researchers, those who come and they, they learn something from Orville that they best is to learn and go more for the experiential learning. This is what I would suggest. You know, you can come get exposure, inspiration, information, data, see the practice, but best is to see also. Uh, to develop it back, like take something which can be developed back. And if you need any kind of help, mentoring, hand holding, uh, even awareness, feel free to contact. I can, you have seen my email ID also, or I can put mine also in the chat here in some time. So it is very much possible. It is very, I mean, I would personally suggest any institute and any place in India, whatever is talking and they are supposed to be dealing with sustainability. They have to be honest and courageous enough to walk the talk. Their campus first uh, foremost should be sustainable. As simple as that. Thank you. So this is huge. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. thank you because we we need to move on to the next. Absolutely. Speaker. I would have loved to uh, have more Absolutely. engagement on this, but I guess you can put your uh, email on the chat box for everybody I to will. directly connect with you. And sure. I think this sum and substance of a lot of things that are happened in Oroville is the focus on the inner world to changing yourself. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, with that, I would like to now introduce our uh, second speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Anne Rademacher. Uh, Dr. Anne Rademacher has a uh, master's in environmental studies and PhD from Yale University. Uh, she's a professor of environmental studies at New York University. Her research explores the political and cultural dimensions of sustainability in cities. Her lens is urban ecology and its scientific contours, its applications across cultural and political contexts, and its interaction with social change. 
Her books uh, include Building Green, Environmental Architects and the Struggle for Sustainability in Mumbai. Uh, that was in 2017, University of California Press. Places of Nature in Ecologies of Urbanism is her second book uh, published by Hong Kong University and University of Chicago Press in 2017. Then there is one in 2011, uh, Raining the River, Urban Ecologies and Political Transformation in Kathmandu and Ecologies of Urbanism in India, Metropolitan Civility and Sustainability, again, Hong Kong University and Uni University of Chicago in 2013. A new volume titled Death and Life of Nature in Asian Cities was published in 2021. So I think uh, with that background, uh, we are just waiting to hear from you and uh, about uh, what we can do in cities. Over to you. Over to you, Anne. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Roshni. Thank you, Lalit, for beautifully framing and reminding us how important uh, the city as a living curriculum is. And what a wonderful example Oroville sets. Your photographs reminded me of the privilege that I had to learn in Oroville among a set of environmental architects, along with Roshni, many, many wow. years ago. So thank you very much. Thank you also, Sunanda. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to say that I'm joining you from Lower Manhattan uh, at the start of a workday. That means that you may hear the morning bustle in the background because I'm just by a window and uh, I apologize in advance if there is noise in the background. We'll hope for the best here. Um, allow me to share my screen and get started. For the reasons that Roshni so beautifully outlined uh, at the outset of our gathering and that Lalit has uh, also named and reminded us, resilience, this term seems to be the refrain of the present in the sense that we hear it referred to constantly as the thing we need to understand. And yet I think it can mean very different things depending on the perspective and the context in some registers, resilience can signal the idea of a fortress, a, a strong, the strongest possible protection to keep the integrity of what's already there. And then in other registers, I think it can signal the fundamental expectation that conditions are in a state of constant and only partially predictable change. And so I want to address this tension from my own location this morning in New York and my own point of view, um, as an invitation to think together about how we can live in and continue to make positive change in the realities of our present world. And by our present world, I really do mean just that. Literally the day before, Roshni contacted me about sharing comments at today's forum. I'd been glued to that day's international climate news headlines. And these were of course about record rainfall in Delhi, just putting another point on the fact that the monsoon in South Asia is in many ways something that is now met with equal parts dread as it is a uh, celebration. This morning's news um, from Beijing and other parts of China, every day we, we are, led and met with some new aspect of the major um, climate transformations underway. Uh, no matter where you were in the world in early July, that is when Roshni invited me to share with you today, you were likely aware of the record rainfall that battered swathes of Northwest India, and you were probably also uh, reading international headlines about um, the rainfall of this year's monsoon, which at that point had been about 60% greater than in a typical season. The rain in Delhi, for example, as many of you will know, on July 9th was the worst in over 40 years. The capital was paralyzed. And every time we experience these record-breaking or new record-setting events, whether it's in South Asia, or it's here in North America or anywhere around the world. We're reminded of that basic fact that the atmosphere's temperature as it rises also increases its capacity to hold moisture. 
That means that climate change will probably contribute to heavier rainfall in many regions. On July 10th, I saw reference to a study published in 2021, and that gave the figure that for every degree Celsius of global warming, the Indian subcontinent can expect an additional 5.3% of precipitation during the monsoon. That is a lot more rain for the, as Lali called it, the hardware of our cities to drain and uh, take in. We also know that most big cities are coastal or built up around major water bodies like rivers. We know that the reality of infrastructure itself and the built environment itself plays a central role in making intense rain and drainage events even worse. Uh, recalling as Lalit shared the photographs from Chennai airport, just as one example. And we all, I think, want to orient our professions and our practices to mitigate and minimize harm. And if we can uh, minimize the ecological, ma sorry, maximize the ecological and human vitality that might be possible even in the midst of climate change. Now, um, I am not an architect, I'm not a design practitioner, but I do have a keen interest in the vast potential of the design toolbox and the examples and ideas that are being implemented around the world that I think can guide us as we all seek to respond uh, responsibly to the climate of the present and the future. So part of what I would like to do today is look at some examples from New York City, where I am this morning and where I live and work, and uh, a few from the coastal Northeastern United States. Um, and I'll call the examples that they set a kind of resilience fast, that is the, the toolbox, the design and social strategies that can act as case studies of experiments. They're happening elsewhere, but they may give us wherever we are some kinds of tools to start with or, or work with. I'll look at projects that many of you, depending on your field of expertise, may already know, projects from here in New York, one that is moving forward uh, seemingly quite successfully and another that has encountered a lot of turbulence in its implementation. And as we look at them together, uh, there are points when I'll ask us to pause and remember just how difficult it is to implement resilience planning. I'll refer to those pauses as resilience slow, in which we stop to notice how complexity and context and trade-offs can always confound our efforts and send us back uh, to the drawing board. And quickly though, I just want to repeat, I am not an architect or planner or design practitioner, but I learn a great deal from people in those professions. My research is centered in what we call integrated urban ecology, which means that I work in teams with scientists and social scientists to try to understand how environmental and social conditions change in tandem, or as we say, co-produce each other. I have worked across uh, cities in South Asia, but as I live and teach in New York, those, that's where the examples I'll use today will come from. Um, I have joint training, as Roshni said, in environmental science, but also in cultural anthropology. And when I work as an urban ecologist in my research, that's the core competency that I, um, that I use. I co-convene with a set of colleagues, a field urban ecology lab group that we call the NYU Urban Greening Lab. And Lalit talking about the city as a living curriculum resonates so clearly with the way that we like to teach and learn together in our urban greening lab. Um, when we work with students, we try to emphasize the ways that the science of environmental change intersects with questions like, what kinds of measures are we taking here in New York? And how might those measures help or harm the urban ecosystem as we try to respond to environmental pressures? And most importantly, whose voices and experiences shape and then drive the plans and programs that actually get implemented in New York? And what's left out? Who is left out? Can we do better? Right, so one of the first things that I do in the context of the Urban Greening Lab is name attention between the ecological concept of resilience and the ways we tend to think about resilience in practice in New York. 
That is to say, in ecology, ever since the 1970s, ecologists have understood ecosystems as complex and without a single predetermined blueprint or pathway for development. That is a long way from older ideas about succession and climax communities and a certain kind of ecosystem having a correct map toward sustainability. Instead, we now see ecological systems as ongoing processes that are always in dialogue with disturbances, major disruptions that can remake their blueprint entirely. In other words, in Lalit's terms, hardware and software, uh, we now think of that hardware of ecosystems as potentially transformed into other kinds of hardware. Let me tell you what I mean. Instead of having one ideal state or set of very clear successive phases, in resilience ecology, ecosystems are understood as having many possible stable states separated only by certain thresholds or boundaries that once they're crossed, signal a fundamental reordering of the components of the system. If you look at the four examples on the slide and then pay attention especially to the second column marked with the green arrow, you see examples of this from uh, various states for urban ecosystems. In the first one, which is described as a well-developed and well-managed city, it would take a major climate event, for example, to drive that system to a state of fundamental reorganization, which we refer to in resilience ecology as regime shift. In the second urban system though, which is riddled with environmental damage and social inequality, it would take a less intense disturbance to move the system to fundamental change. And so we say that this is a relatively less resilient system. The third example, number three, is even less resilient as this is a city in the grip of some kind of large scale strife, both social and ecological. And that fourth example reminds us that cities can be deeply embedded in a state of devastation. Just as it would take different levels of disturbance to move those first three examples to a major shift or regime shift, in the fourth, the regime shift to a healthier and more vital system would take a considerable effort to disturb or dislodge. We're reminded then that in ecological thinking, in the science itself, disturbance is expected and it's also regarded as neutral. It's not necessarily um, productive of a good or bad outcome. It's simply the way ecosystem is ecosystems change. The other key point is that disturbance in this register involves destruction and the release of resources. So we expect systems to reorganize, but again, destruction itself is expected in ecology, at least at the level of conceptualizing ecosystems, losses and destruction are regarded as neutral realities of the way that ecosystems change. Now, contrast that with the way we tend to think about resilience in actual lived life. There are a zillion definitions at this point to choose from for urban resilience that are circulating globally. But today I'll invoke the 100 Resilient Cities Networks definition which underlines adaptation, survival, and growth. In contrast to the expectations of some forms of loss and destruction in resilience ecology, in social terms, we generally want to minimize losses of all kinds. We emphasize questions of how fast and how much communities or cities or institutions can recover and we tend to think of recovery as getting back to what we were before the stress or shock, rather than losing some components, reorganizing and changing into completely new hardware. This tends to create some very tall order, complicated ideals, like those that populate this ring diagram. These are the characteristics of resilient systems. And I dare say that they are only 
real in concept. Aspiration, great guidelines, and yet very, very difficult to implement in the present. So my point here is that there is something in the translation between our understanding of how the environment works and our desires for society and social systems to improve and be resilient that sits in tension. And that I would like to suggest that we always need to hold in dialogue when we're talking about planning for resilience under conditions of climate change. This is particularly true, I think, because our resilience fast toolbox is filled with nature-based solutions, and I think rightly so. These are ways to move forward that hope to integrate urban development with environmental systems insofar as is possible. In other words, how can we integrate a city that's sited on coastal marshland? How can we integrate the infrastructure with that marshland to make sure that when environmental events happen, the relationship between the hardware of the city and environmental events is as harmonious as possible. The tools and case studies here on the Naturally Resilient Communities website, which uh, I highly recommend, these are widely available. And with a marvelous tool like this NRC one, we can name the hazard type, as you can see on the left. We can specify our geographic location. We can decide on environmental goals, and then we can look at case studies that help to guide us with some basic, again, hardware ideas that we can then implement in different places and um, uh, adapt according to circumstances. There are many, many toolkits like this, more and more, and they provide us with a lot of insight into nature-based solution building in a resilience fast kind of posture. I'm also a big fan of a, uh, an institute called CIRCA, the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation. This is the state of Connecticut's uh, hub for climate and marine science, but it's also a wonderful example of an institute that's committed to providing climate change information to coastal communities along the northeast coast of the U.S., as well as extensive support for communities that are situated on that coastline where sea level is expected to rise considerably and who want to make changes to build more resilient, both built environments and social environments. There are many, many really wonderful efforts at integrating um, the science that we know and the complex social interventions we have to take in order to achieve more resilient places. This brings me to New York City, where I'm speaking uh, to you from this evening and where among many social and environmental aspirations, resilience planning tends to invoke the major shocks that we as a city have experienced together. Two of the big ones that tend to come back into the public, both um, experiential memory, but also into policy conversations are our recent experiences of, first of all, Hurricane Ida, which created unsurvivable conditions in many parts of the city and leave a very strong legacy uh, today. And the other one that, although not as recent, also exemplifies an event that underscores, or sorry, that undoes our sense of safety and survivability in New York City. That was Superstorm Sandy that happened all the way back in 2012 that still lives large in conversations about ecological resilience in New York. This was the largest storm that was ever recorded in New York and it hit at the worst possible time in terms of tides, creating storm surges that topped eight and a half feet above normal in some places. That caused massive flooding that followed and confounded all of our expectations, leading New York City to realize that our flood maps were way out of date. We were depending on flood predictions from the set in the 1970s, and these did us absolutely no good in 2012. The losses were enormous in terms of life 
and homes, but also in terms of things like lost power, which in vertical New York meant the loss of water and sanitation for anyone who lived above the fourth floor of a building. Water has to be pumped using electricity above the fourth floor in order to have enough pressure um, to run it through a system. It hit our residents in our public housing system, the worst of all, that is our lowest income residents. In sub public housing communities, services like water and sanitation and heat were not restored after Sandy until well into the winter months. For those who turn all the losses uh, that a city incurs after a storm into the language of dollars, this became at the time the second costliest storm in United States history, second only to Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans uh, in 2005. I lived in, oh, my screen seems to be frozen. One moment, there we go. I lived in the West Village of Manhattan at that time where following the storm, a catastrophic explosion at an electricity substation left millions of people without power. And some of my family members at that time lived on Long Island where communities were literally upended. Infrastructure like boardwalks, as you see in the photograph, were literally turned upside down. All right, so it's events like these that New Yorkers tend to hold in mind when we look for ways, uh, as some municipal officials have said, to quote, build back better. Which leads me to the two case studies that I brought to share. The, uh, and as I said, you may, as, you may be familiar with both of these. Um, the first one is the Big U Project, proposed uh, in the years after Sandy, this proposed 10 miles of continuous protective uh, green infrastructure around Lower Manhattan from 57th Street South all the way around the Battery, as you see in, in the rendering, and up to 42nd Street. It had three major components. The Big Bench, which was a continuous and protective floodable green infrastructure. That's what's highlighted uh, in the rendering. The Battery Berm, which was an elevated path through the park, and something called the Bridging Berm, which rose 14 feet by the highways that uh, circle the that circle Manhattan um, and connected coastal communities with the greenways themselves. That Bridging Berm was designed to cap existing coastal roadways, the FDR Expressway. And it also was intended to enable new forms of public transport infrastructure. At the top of the rendering, you see the park, which would flood in high water events. And the addition of that long berm along the perimeter of the park would separate it from the inland housing that's there on the left um, and whatever future flooding events may occur on the right in that fl uh, floodable green infrastructure. The combined effects of creating a floodable park on one hand and reducing motor vehicle traffic would improve public health, theoretically, for the large population of low income people of color who were also some of the most affected after Sandy and who live right in that cluster on the lower uh, east side where the public housing um, developments are, are many. At the same time, it was expected that this would reduce greenhouse gases, which are, of course, at the end of the day, a major source of the planet warming that is the ultimate cause of sea level rise and other climate disturbances that are now our lived reality. So with a more natural connection between the city and its surrounding estuary, people would be able to engage with their local waterways. They'd have more of an opportunity to connect with those waterways, and the city would be more resilient. Key inlets during Sandy would be addressed with this berm system and new public spaces were conceptualized to be created as also floodable um, infrastructure. Along the East River, the plan was produced with input from the residents of the historically working class Lower East Side. 
As I said earlier, this is one of the largest blocks of New York City Housing Authority or, um, or NYCHA tenants, public housing tenants in all of our five boroughs. And so many of those 28,000 public housing residents supported this plan, this big U plan, in which that East River Park, the park that exists there now, would gradually terrace into the river, allowing the rigid bulkhead to soften into a more natural and sloping coastline, as uh, I showed you earlier in the slides. The overall cost estimate of this project was $800 million, in, uh, which if you recall the billions in costs incurred from Sandy, that was a rather incredible calculus of the potential value of green infrastructure at this scale. Think of the savings in the next storm, not just in dollars, but of course in human life and well-being. But many of you may also know that the plan met with turbulence in city agencies. A complex story about the jurisdictions of various parts of our municipal infrastructure and feasibilities and far more detail than we have time for here brought the project to a standstill. First, the big U became a half J and uh, later the situation got even more complex. In 2018, and keeping the water's edge unchanged and the FDR highway preserved. So the new plan, which does uh, get named the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project will cost more than the big U, but will have virtually none of the wave attenuation and transportation changing benefits of that architect led and community led plan, the big U. There are, there's a whole webinar to be had about the what went wrong, but in the end, the floodable infrastructure is no longer in the works in lower Manhattan. And this is quite likely to our detriment down the line. I want us to notice it was in the implementation at the municipal level that our ability to think about complex integration broke down. The complexity of our social institutions is what got in the way in the end of implementing the big U. All right, the second example is a little bit more, uh, we're a little more optimistic. This is one you also may be familiar with. Um, it involves green infrastructure that's predicated on the idea of ecological and habitat enhancement. This project recognizes the historical ubiquity of oyster reefs in New York Harbor and how oysters acted as a key ecosystem species in keeping the ecology of the New York Harbor healthy. The mastermind behind this project is the landscape architect Kate Orff and her partners at Scape Landscape Architecture. They've designed a project which they call Living Breakwaters. And this, the living breakwaters are submerged mound structures that are designed to reduce flood risk and to create marine habitat. The project involves sand replenishment where sand um, erosion has been happening for a very long time, as well as educational and ecological stewardship programs for local and regional communities. The project creates a kind of integrated ecological, structural and social resilience by working both with the environment and with communities. The structures provide wave attenuation and erosion protection, and they're sited in a part of Staten Island, particularly an area called Tottenville, that has endured a battering in recent years. Um, every time a big storm comes, it's that particular part, um, the southwestern part of Staten Island, that seems to bear the brunt. During Hurricane Sandy, this was a place that was hit very, very hard. Now, the breakwaters are not your usual breakwaters. Uh, these are designed to provide marine habitat. And as a result, they maximize the ecosystem services associated um, with those breakwaters. 
As I said earlier, a key aspect of this is oyster reef creation in partnership with another organization that um, I'm a big fan of. It's called the Billion Oyster Project in New York. Um, even at its best though, unfortunately, uh, the realities of ecological resilience give us cause for pause. So if we move into resilience slow here, you see in this rendering growing ecological resilience, the berms and the idea that we're creating habitat on top of the berms is um, there are a lot, a lot of oyster uh, bed seeding uh, activities that are happening. Unfortunately, the science of um, marine ecosystems is also teaching us that turns out that oysters are some of the more vulnerable organisms in the context of climate change. They're extremely sensitive to temperature and pH changes. And since they cannot just up and move when water temperatures rise or an area acidifies, it's simply not clear what happens to the living part of living breakwaters as marine ecosystems experience the elevated water temperatures that we are now observing and experiencing worldwide. This has, of course, been a top line news item this summer in particular. And so even a project that's moving forward and is showing great promise as green infrastructure will face challenges when it comes to the underlying environmental conditions and the rapid transformation of um, the conditions for life that they represent. So we're back to resilience fast and slow. Even in our best green infrastructure efforts, there will be limits to what is possible because there are limits to the knowability of how ecosystems change and what kinds and intensities of disturbance will send them into, as we said at the outset, a new basin. As we saw with the big U, those limits can also be in the political economic realm and the complexity of urban institutions, power relations and governance is always something that we need to address to prevent it from confounding our ability to implement, especially community led design. A last note about optimizing our interventions and then I'll conclude. And it's both social and ecological. The urban ecologist Eric Sanderson reminds us over and over again that the landscapes that host our cities have ecological histories and those histories matter. Um, again, when Lalit invoked for us the Chennai airport flooded and our understanding of that flooding has everything to do with its relationship to a river and um, riverine flooding, that's the same point that Sanderson is making. We're reminded of the ecological history of an urban landscape exactly in those moments of environmental stress and shocks. In New York, our example of that, the one that's iconic at the moment, is when Hurricane Ida struck in 2021. When it struck the New York area, a waterway in the Bronx, Tibbetts Brook, that had been previously capped over and converted into sewage and drainage, like basically a conduit um, at a different moment in history, flooded. And in its flooding, it flooded one of our major expressways and caused terrible damage, suffering, and fatality. Sanderson likes to say that the landscape will remind us of its history, whether we ask it or not. So we either move forward with that history in mind, or we will be painfully reminded just when we're enduring the worst of shocks. And so luckily in New York, after Hurricane Ida, there are now plans to what's called daylight Tibbetts Brook, that is open it back up and bring it back into at least um, an open surface flow acknowledging its history as a brook and its future as, uh, as a brook in the system. Okay, I'll conclude here and just remind us that no matter where we are in the world, in the US or elsewhere, there is no map of so-called safe or unsafe places under conditions of climate change. There are only resilient communities and resilient ecologies our ability to accept and embrace change 
in social material built and ecological terms is what will determine resilience fast and slow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for that wonderful presentation. And, uh, you know, for, for bringing us the ecologist uh, perspective, ecological perspective, and for introducing us all these terminologies like resilience ecology, resilience planning, you know, it's surely showing us that um, the way we have been doing things so far, especially the architects and urban planners need to change. And uh, I think I can trace it back to what Lalit was talking about, uh, interdisciplinary education, which is now the focus everywhere. And it seems that, uh, you know, we need to work together. Uh, I mean, different fields need to work together. So, uh, and you you talked about a lot of various, uh, introduced us to various organizations like Circa. I, we were not aware that there are organizations which are you know actively working towards resilience and climate adaptation which is really the the need of the hour uh, there are a few questions but I'm not uh, sure how very relevant there's one question by ritu uh, which i would like to read it's about i would like to know how we can integrate the design toolbox with ecology and the built environment is there a possibility to bridge the two amicably? Ritu is here, yeah. She's, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that question. I I believe that there must be. We we don't have a choice, we've got to integrate them. And I think that um the challenge is sitting between the need for tools and that unpredictability factor. It is the moment when, for example, we've designed the Living Breakwaters project for Staten Island and it is dependent on oysters, and then the marine ecology is changing so quickly that the oysters can no longer anchor that design. The challenge is to, I think, um, create designs that anticipate in every aspect the need to very quickly adapt. And I'm not sure materially what that looks like, design-wise what that looks like. Um, but I think that it's only in holding that toolbox in conversation with the what went wrong moments as we as we go um, that, that we're going to solve it. Somewhere there has to be a, a possibility to make living breakwaters perhaps more adaptive to those warmer waters and without um, losing the resilience contributions that those breakwaters represent. Um, yeah, and, and this is why I think that planners, architects, urban professionals of all kinds are need to be at the vanguard of the resilience challenge. Um, if we're just going along the municipal kind of policy makers, the way that we saw here in New York with the big U, we will wind up with the least cost, easiest, quick fix solution. And we will constantly be enduring new stories of, I think, catastrophic uh, consequences when big shocks happen. Thank you, thank you. There's, there's a question from Shobit which says, um, <laughs> which is a bigger threat, climate change or bad planning of our cities and <laughs> failed mathematical models to predict these changes. Mm. Such a wonderful point. We are in every sector, we are imperfect in our practice, right? And again, I think the only way forward is the kind of integration that Lalit was suggesting that um, I think many of us are trying very hard to engage in to work together from different core capacities, but without hubris, um, recognizing that even in our climate models, they really are changing so quickly that the ability to predict what things really will look like in 2050 is anybody's guess. Part of why I wanted to um, start with that, that snapshot from the New York Times of Mumbai, 
and inundation in Mumbai after the climate revision, which was published in Climate Communications, you had a very different picture of a city reclaiming its old landscape history, right? We're back to seven islands by the time of the 2030 predictions now. Whereas just 10 years ago, if you were a planner um, or municipal official, you would not be anticipating the effects of climate change with that intensity. The same with cities all over the country. That New York Times article gives maps for your, all your favorite uh, massive global cities. And all of them are experiencing these huge, um, we see these huge changes just because our climate models have gotten up to a different kind of speed. And next year, and the year after and the year after, these things are likely to continue to change. And so I think we're back to that earlier point. How can we create designs that are as adaptive as possible? You know, the flood, instead of taking a flood map that's revised and saying, okay, that's where the floods are going to be, creating a design that responds not just to today's flood maps, but the flood maps that may be revised to show much more intense effects in years to come. Thanks, Anne. There is a lot of interest in the toolbox. I think the one that you showed with <laughs> there is Raj Kampat who is asking, uh, thank you, Anne, for the thought-provoking talk. And looking forward, we need to integrate the natural solutions with technologies for resilient challenges. Please share the information on the toolbox that you were talking about. Will do. I actually made a document with web links for many of the slides that I shared, especially those organizations and those websites that contain tools or like with Circa, I think are good examples of what's possible from an institutional point of view to provide educational um, resources to all of us as practitioners and to communities too. So what I can do is um, maybe Roshni after the session, I can share that document yeah. uh, and then we all can, uh, depending on your interest, we can all follow up. Also, I referenced many scientific articles and you know the article in Nature Communication, et cetera. Some of you may have interest in following up on those as well. I'll provide all of that after the, the webinar. Yes, I think you started off by saying it's an invitation to think together. I think that was a great, uh, we have a lot of people here and we can all think together um and uh, you know take things uh, forward we have uh, gone past our time but uh, i would just like lalit is also here and you are also here maybe we have one last uh, comment from you on uh, what kind of uh, you know resilience measures we can look for in planning of new cities uh, because we both uh, uh, we talked about oroville of course which is a you know newly developed uh, completely on ground zero it was developed uh, and we have something like manhattan and something like mumbai which already exists and we have we have got to make the changes in in these and interesting solutions like the big u project you know so what would be like your um, maybe what would you suggest uh, for upcoming planning of upcoming towns and cities what kind of uh, new thinking needs to go in terms of uh, climate resilience uh, in every possible way? Like Lalit talked about food and all of food security, water. So what would you, um, I'd leave, it, leave the floor open to both of you, whoever wants to go in first, uh, what kind of message would you like to leave? And then we'll take this forward. I'm sure there'll be many more programs where we will have interactions of this kind. Go ahead, Anne. Uh, I was going to say, go ahead, Lali. <laughs> yeah, um, I would love to be among you and offer you um, a, a great answer. I think the, the best I can do is say that the challenges we face are enormous and they're, they're that much more complex because we're living inside of them. They are absolutely a moving target. So perhaps the best we can do, I think, is take the message of Lalit's talk very seriously um, insofar as we need to be humble, know that we can learn from one another and that our experiences, positive and negative, may be our best guides through this, um, this set of changes that human beings haven't, haven't had to endure, at least at this pace. 
and adapt to so quickly. Um, in our history, we don't know this situation. So the best thing I think that we can do is um, learn to work together with humility, but also genuine resolve. Um, take resilience fast wherever we can, that is respond with the tools we have, but also take resilience slow and recognize that the systems we're dealing with are complex. They're not just complicated, they're complex. That means they may change entirely. The hardware of today's city may, because of resilience ecology, be a very different hardware tomorrow. And the, in some ways, our abilities are limited, but let us maximize what we can do by working together. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. Lalit, any final words from you? Wow. <laughs> uh, you, uh, Roshni, you mentioned about the new cities, just to understand the question. Are you talking about new greenfield project? Yes, yes. Greenfield and also, you know, smaller towns which are now growing into bigger cities where we need a lot of good urban planning, environmental design. So uh, if, if we can develop or we can give chance to the process where all kind of knowledge, you know, resources, they can come together and some organization, entity, group of people, whatever name we can call, if they can hold the process and complete the process and dem demonstrate uh, the right things. So for me, you know, the honesty and truthfulness and being courageous, uh, these are the factors which will make anything resilience. If we are able to deal and with ourselves, like I use the framework of self, society, and environment. So if I'm honest with myself, with the society, so the outcome, like whatever we see in the city is an external expression of who we are. If there is a lots of garbage, if there is a lots of problem and unorganized and chaotic things, this is the way we are at that point in time as a civilization. Very simple. So to expect wonderful miracle just because some storm or climate change flooding will awaken you. I mean, there are different examples. We may still not be awakened. Uh, we are very tough. Our D our DNA has proven <laughs> resilience to change, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if uh, what comes and most of my, let us say, insight, knowledge, understanding comes from my first-hand living experience from Orwell. So I tend to go on that line. Imagine there is a, there are institutions, uh, there are colleges, there are young people, there are business houses, those who are going to be benefiting using that space, new city, old city revival. If people can develop, so for me, the word is capacity. If we, our systems can learn to enhance and be humble with holding capacity, which I generally I feel we don't have. No, we, we fall for very basic survival level tactics. So this is a very low, operating our human machine with this potential on a very low order. We are much more capable. We can do much, much better things. And even historically, it is proven. If we know how to come together. So learning how to come together, work together, I think is the key. And to create conditions to enable those possibility and to have capacity to enable them. I think that is there lies the... Uh, the message, the challenge, or perhaps answer for the way I see. I can, I can give a short example to highlight, which uh, I did not in my presentation. Uh, many bigger cities in India have 25 to 30 architecture colleges. I'm just focusing on that. Uh, many groups come to me in Auroville, and after talking to them for one day, I ask them, where you friendly, jokingly, how many of you will continue after continuing completing your architecture? How many of you will come continue in the architecture allied field? I don't know if you'll be surprised or not. 60 to 70% say they will not. So I'm not saying it is alarming, bad, horrible, no comment, no judgment. 
they have the right to make their choices they can change based on their value system totally fine but my point is the youth of india i'm just specifically saying the youth of india is passing through a certain critical stage of shaping their mindset understanding if if during that time they are given a possibility of exposure experiences learning ability how they learn how to relate with their living environment forget cities let us call living environment if they learn how to and there is a possibility i can give examples if each college takes 5 km radius as their engagement zone very simple we know how architecture is taught in india let us let us not go in the depth but the basic practicality of that is people keep doing all kind of case studies if those case studies are taken with the 5 km engagement zone you map resources every every year one studio will take something not a single architecture college i have seen apart from perhaps saft and other with those who are presenting and sharing their work learning on any website how can that be are we not proud of what we are learning if not then let us do better things my point is there is a huge possibility to turn the whole thing with the integrated vision imagine each architecture college is acting as a resource arm resource hub for a city we are doing redevelopment project you know we the students are taught have they ever gone back to the people up for whom they have developed have they ever reached out to municipal development authorities it may still not happen it may be full of fault understandable they are a student they are learning faculties may be inexperienced but at least you start marching on that journey of bringing a new culture how you are teaching you are giving chance to your youth to learn how to engage with the city irrespective of what they do tomorrow they may be in architecture or not how many of you can come on a cycle and pedestrian pathway within 5 km radius zone very simple practical mapping of the water bodies in 5 km zone simple once you give them that possibility they are very intelligent the next question will naturally come so you just have to ignite the flame i think i think that is what we should be doing thank you i think that's wonderful and i think what you are doing with the students who are coming to oroville and what ann is doing in her urban greening lab and various other forums uh, needs to spread and there, sh- there needs to be a lot of sharing through uh, i remember when we were having our masters course in environmental architecture we used to do a lot of live projects doing this mapping was exactly one of the things that we we were encouraging our students to do and this needs to happen more often and i think there's also need to integrate now you know to have a more interdisciplinary approach than to just look at architectural perspective we also need to hear from the ecologists the engineers and so on Absolutely. so uh, thank you so much um, both uh, uh, dr ran and the lalit for this session uh, i'm sure there will be more dialogue on this there's a lot of interest people have said to share presentations uh, all of this is uh, live on facebook so everything is there for everybody to see uh, so thank you so much and i will now hand over to back to sunanda hi everyone wow i hope you're energized it was one thought provoking and actionable webinar what i really enjoyed was and i'll just take one or two more minutes is that uh, lalit and ann took us from orville to new york and back whereas lalit's presentation focused on action started with the beautiful quote that city is a living curriculum and through examples he showed in orville how they have actually integrated like you know how many solutions they've integrated and it ended with uh, like you know call to engage to transform when we looked at ann's presentation the words that again struck out to me were community led design again a call to people to take actions what was fascinating was that time and again she said that we have to be brave to be able to face the situations where okay we lose sight of the previous uh, solutions that we had in mind and we look at new solutions like floodable parks how cool is that like you know something that's proposed in the big u uh, project and in, even in living uh, waters 
and it reminded me of this quote by Albert Einstein that we cannot solve a problem with the same mindset that created it. So I think with that inspiration and on that note, I'll thank you all for joining us today, for staying back for the entire webinar. And be sure that IER will be back again with similarly energizing and provoking and future ready webinars. Until then, be good, good luck and best regards. Thank you. Thank you.